Good morning, everybody. I am so pleased to come back to Nephrology Education Series. Our topic today is very special because it was the opening ceremony of starting the advances in training of renal nutrition and dialysis. So the, our topic is chronic kidney disease, definitions, risk factors for progression, and how to retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. The workshop was held at Mansour of Faculty of Medicine on Wednesday, November 16. Today, I'm going to um, record it uh, with some uh, modifications. So I'm going to um, uh, discuss these issues under definitions of chronic kidney disease and what's meant by progression, and then uh, different risk factors for progression, and at the end, I'll conclude with uh, recommendations. To start with, how to define chronic kidney disease is by looking at the values of estimated GFR or calculated GFR by calculators as guidelines stated, or looking at urine. So renal dysfunction is either presence of low GFR or abnormal urinary finding. Here, this is an example of GFR calculator. It, uh, it is downloaded from the, this uh, link. You just can write on Google GFR calculator and you can find all these. Just fill in space, serum creatinine if you have, serum cystatin C if you have, and then the age of the patient, and then click on male or female race, and then for example, if you put creatinine in this value and cystatin C in this value for a 50-year old male patient, a non-black, you will find the GFR here calculated. So the, what is the definition of chronic kidney disease? It is the presence of persistent, low estimated or calculated, calculated GFR less than 60 milli per minute. This is the cutoff point for average adult patient. So if it is persistent less than 60, this is for three, more than three months, this is the definition of chronic kidney disease. Or even if calculated GFR is above 60, but there is one or more of the markers of kidney damage, this is, uh, can cope with this cope with the definition. The markers of kidney damage are either albuminuria, out of the normal range, the presence of urinary sediment abnormalities, electrolytes and other abnormalities due, due to tubular disorders like hypokalemia because of renal tubular acidosis, abnormalities detected by histology, structural abnormalities det detected by imaging or history of kidney transplantation. Needless to say, all these abnormalities should be persistent for more than three months. Here is the CKD definitions and staging. Here, these are the five stages based upon estimated GFR. If estimated GFR above 90, but we have markers of kidney damage, this is stage one. And if it is between 90 to 60, it is stage two. Between 60 to 30, it is stage three. Stage three is further subdivided into 3A and 3B. So 3A between 60 to 45, and 3B between 45 to 30. And stage four, estimated GFR is between 15 to 30. And less than 15, it is stage five coronary kidney disease. Again, if Estimated GFR above 60, we should have abnormal, uh, other abnormalities denoting kidney damage. So if we don't have, and albuminuria is within this range, this is a green corner, this means no chronic kidney disease. So what is the normal albuminuria? It is less than 30 milligram albumin per gram creatine, or less than three milligram albumin per millimole creatinine. A2 was considered previously as microalbuminuria. It is 
between 30 to 300 milligram albumin per gram creatinine or between 3 to 30 milligram albumin per millimole creatinine A3, if it is above 300 uh, milligram albumin per gram creatinine or 30 milligram per millimole creatinine or nephrotic range of proteinuria Look here, the progression means that the stage worsens so from stage 1 toward stage 5 and if you look at the color codes here green color, color means a normal person the uh, when the color darken the risk factor increases increases for progression increases for comorbidities and mortality so this is yellow and worsen to orange and more worsening to or uh, red color and the color code here uh, dictates here the patient can follow can have his follow-up with a general, a general practitioner here it's better to refer the more the dark the color the better the re uh, referral to the nephrologist and the more the dark the color the more the necessity for frequent follow-up again progression of chronic kidney disease is worsening of the staging from stage to stage up higher. Rapid progression is defined as sustained decline in estimated GFR of more than five milli per minute per average adult per year. Let us to go to an evidence. Here, the this retrospective cohort study showed patient was in stage three and addressed the effect of progression to stage 4 coronary kidney disease and its correlation with poor outcome here the patient's situations deteriorated from stage 3 to stage 4 death increases ATI acute kidney injury hospitalization increases all cause hospitalization increases so the if there is a progression there is worsening of the outcome again this is the risk of end stage renal disease in japanese patients with chronic kidney disease that was shown in this study to correlate with uh, more the with progression of kidney disease so if there is a decline in gfr and this is the cut of 0.30 to 40 percent decline GF, estimated gfr there is a strong association with end stage kidney disease. So, the more the progression, the more th the more worse the outcome, and the more the worse for the progression toward end stage renal disease. The question is, what are the risk factors for progressions towards end stage kidney disease, or progressing of chronic kidney disease state? The risk factors are very, very frequent and different in different aspects. Usually, we like to classify risk factors into modifiable, potentially modifiable, and non-modifiable risk factors. Even if we know that the risk factor is non-modifiable, we aggressively address other factors in these patients. So what are the predictors or progressions of chronic kidney disease. According to this slide, the factors associated with chronic kidney disease progressions include the cause of chronic kidney disease, level of GFR, level of albuminuria, age of the patient, sex, race, and ethnicity, elevated blood pressure, hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, smoking, obesity, history of cardiovascular disease, and going superior to nephrotoxic drugs, and others. Let us to start with albuminuria. Again and again and again, albuminuria is very important in the definition of chronic kidney disease, and it is very uh, crucial for progression as well. If we look here, this is the clinical outcome associated with albuminuria, in Central Australia a cohort study. Here, the albuminuria predicts the development and the progression of chronic kidney disease 
toward renal failure. The question, if we don't have albuminuria testing, can we look at proteinuria? The answer is yes. But instead of using 30 and 300, we use less than 150 milligram protein between 150 to 500 milligram and above 500 milligram per day. So we can look at proteinuria. So post proteinuria and the albuminuria are considered within the definition of chronic kidney disease and predicts the occurrence of renal failure. Again, this is a very nice uh, study because it is a meta-analysis for assessing filtration markers to predict indecisional disease and mortality. Here, they addressed serum B trace protein, BTB, and beta-2 microglobulin. Here, these serum uh, filtration markers are not working super or better than just albuminuria, looking at albuminuria. So the conclusion is we are stressing upon the following up and the looking at albuminuria. Again, here in this uh, recent article, albuminuria predicts early neurological deterioration in a patient with acute ischemic stroke. Again, albuminuria is within the definition of chronic kidney disease and as can be considered as well as a risk factor for chronic kidney disease progression. Let us look at these non-modifiable risk factors, old age, race, and gender. This is a very nice study because it shows that there is substantial loss of nephrons in healthy human kidneys with aging. Here, this, is this bar, this bright color, reflects non-sclerosed glomeruli. A gray one refers to global sclerosed glomeruli. With aging, the percent, the number of non-sclerosed glomeruli decrease, and the number of global sclerosed glomeruli increases. So, at the end, GFR decrease or drop. So, this is the, by default, this is the physiological with aging. And we have an equation to expect the number or percentage the percentage of global sclerosis glomeruli by age, it is age divided by 2 minus 10. For example, if we have a patient 20 years, 20 divided by 2 minus 10. So if this is no normal person, 20 divided by 2 minus 10 equals 0. So if we do biopsy for a healthy person on the 20 age, we will find nothing sclerosed. But if the same person lives for a healthy life until the age of 100, 100 divided by 2 minus 10 equal 40%. This means 50, uh, approximately half of both kidneys are lost because of aging. It's a very nice philosophical and opinion paper because here the authors look at the cutoff point of 60 milli per minute which is the cutoff point for definition of chronic kidney disease and its application was different ages. The authors here, uh, from their opinion, they uh, looked at the cutoff point of 60 is underestimating the problem in the young persons less than 40 years and they suggest that it is better to use 75 milli per minute in this age and for persons above 65, using cut point 60, below 60, is overestimating the problem, and it's better to use 45 in the aged or old age patients. Again, chronic kidney disease in elderly, elderly may reflect hypertension in the middle age, so we should take care of the blood pressure. This is a very recent review about renal aging causes and consequences if we look at age-related signals, here you can find increasing cell senescence, presence of pro-fibrotic signals, all these, vascular responses, abnormalities, as you see here, inflammation environment, inflammation, increasing oxidative damage, 
So all these are age-related signals. What are the consequences of these signals? Is structural changes, drop in GFR, and more important, important for my perspective is tubular dysfunction. So in old age, there is drop in sodium reabsorption, drop in concentrating capacity, drop in response to fludrocortisone. So, and these persons in the aged group are more prone to dehydration and they cannot deal well with uh, volume uh, like over drinking. So we should be careful about handling and dealing with aged patients. This is a very nice figure because it shows factors implicated as pathogenic and renal aging. All these are factors. And more important is the potential future anti-aging therapies and their role in renal aging is very interesting. Here, these drugs are uh, already tested and they are in clinical use using S inhibitors or androtensinase with blockers, the bar gamma agonist, agonists, tested in experimental animals, and we are waiting studies in human, like antioxidant inhi inhibitors to oppose G2M arrest, use of senolytic agents, clothal supplementation, and not yet used in renal models, and they are potential, like precise stabilization, vasculogenesis, opposition of senescence. The gummy race. This is a very nice study because it included 3,700 persons. It, just to compare CKD progression and mortality among Hispanic and non-Hispanics. Here, this is the, the number and the percentage of individuals. If you look here, the progression or occurrence of endocytic kidney disease here in Hispanic, it is comparable to non-Hispanic black, but significantly higher than non-Hispanic white. Mortality to the reverse, mortality in, his, in Hispanic is relatively more than the, uh, the uh, non-Hispanic. Another study shows all the different races. If you look here, the, uh, this race, which is non-Hispanic, Asian and Pacific, the cumulative instance of indecision kidney disease is uh, more frequent in this race. So it, seem, it's, it seems that the race also affects CKD progression. Regarding the gender, this according to United States renal uh, data uh, on 2000 and 2013, here men either on 2013, the black and the white circles, uh, 2013 and 2000, these are men. As you see, the incidence of indecision kidney disease is more common in men than women. So it seems that men or males are more risky for progression of coronary kidney disease. There is a correlation between gender and uh, coronary kidney disease. Coronary kidney disease is more in men and coronary kidney disease is associated by disturbance of hormonal environment in women. This, this, this figure shows the hormonal functions. Hypothalamus releases gonadotrophin releasing hormone pulses and dopamine, and pituitary response to gonadotrophin releasing hormone by secreting LH, FSH pulses, and then ovary by uh, secreting estradiol. All these factors are disturbed in uremia and chronic kidney disease. Here, chronic kidney disease inhibit high estradiol mediated pulsatile secretion of gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Here, also, LH and FSH is inhibited, are inhibited by coronary kidney disease. And here, prolactin clearance, which is, uh, we don't like prolactin here. Prolactin clearance is reduced in chronic kidney disease. And here, dopamine, which is inhibitor of prolactin, is inhibited in chronic kidney disease. So, there is a crosstalk between uh, female gender and chronic kidney disease. Female gender is protected from chronic kidney disease a little bit, and chronic kidney disease disturb the hormonal environment in the in the female in the women. So the clinical outcomes that have been associated 
with low estradiol in the female population with kidney disease include decreased bone mineral density, decreased kidney function, increased cardiovascular risk, decreased high dense lipoprotein, and fertility and ovulation, menstrual disorders, premature menopause, decreased sexual desire. All these are disturbed in the uh, chronic kidney disease. So it seems that there is a positive feedback between gender and uh, kidney function. So females are more protected than men. This is why uh, keeping in touch with your feminine side is better for the kidney than men. And this, if I, uh, and here this is a nice study because it shows even risk factors for progressions of chronic kidney disease differ according to the gender. Proteinuria is more impressive and more effective in, in men, while glycemia, this glycemia is more risky in female. More important, this is a, a very interesting case report because this is a case of hypogonadism treated with testosterone. With treatment of testosterone, kidney function worsen and kidney perfusion by the CT uh, imaging uh, showed uh, reduction in the kidney perfusion. So it seemed that testosterone is bad for the kidney. So according to this sector of discussion, women are partially protected. The risk factors for chronic kidney disease progression is more in men. We don't, we don't know if female sex hormone is protective or male sex hormone testosterone is bad. The most important and, and, and exciting question, do we recommend using female sex hormone? The answer up to this moment, we cannot recommend that. We are waiting further studies, but if we have ladies with, pre, with premature menopause, it's better to uh, give them hormonal replacement therapy. Regarding hypertension, this is one of the modifiable risk factors. So up to this moment, I discussed with you definition of chronic kidney disease, what's meant by progression, and then I addressed the non-modifiable risk factors, which are age, race, and gender. Although they are not modifiable, but they give us a hint to address all other modifiable risk factors in, this, in these populations. Regarding hypertension, we have here in this uh, uh, slide uh, what's meant by controlled blood pressure, white coat hypertension, musket hypertension, sustained hypertension. White coat hypertension means that both clinical values and 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure recordings uh, here the clinic are high, but the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring uh, is fine. In musket hypertension, the clinic blood pressure is low, it was in normal range, and this is very uh, sneaky because the 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring showed high blood pressure. So, the definition of musket hypertension is normal office and high 24 hour or high nocturnal blood pressure. Sustained hypertension means high blood pressure during the office recording and within the 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. If we ask, if you ask, if you ask me if I should select one of these, nocturnal or diurnal hypertension, it, it, I'll select diurnal hypertension because nocturnal hypertension is very bad and associated with more progression of kidney disease and as well the mortality. Regarding hypertension guidelines, regarding the issue of goal and target. When should we treat hypertension in patients with diabetes? Look here. Here, if the blood pressure low and therapy is used in a diabetic patient and systolic blood pressure is above 150, uh, here you'll find all beneficial effects, decreasing cost, all cost mortality, decreased cardiovascular mortality, decreased myocardial infarction, and reduction in indecision disease or reduction in the progression or retarding progression of coronary kidney disease. So all the beneficial effects we'll, we will have if we use blood pressure lowering therapies for a diabetic patient with systolic blood pressure exceeding 150. But if the blood pressure is between, 
between 140 to 150. Here you find as well the benefits are there. But if systolic blood pressure is less than 140 and you will use blood pressure lower in therapies in diabetic, here you'll find a very sur surprising uh, results, increasing cardiovascular mortality and all cause mortality. So we don't like aggressive reduction of blood pressure in diabetic. This is the Canadian guideline for blood pressure control in chronic kidney disease. If you have a patient with chronic kidney disease and hypertension, here they, uh, they use the first line antihypertensive drugs that effectively reduce blood pressure. They include angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker or calcium chain blocker or diuretics or beta blockers. All these are considered within the first line antihypertensive drug. When treating hypertension in a patient with coronary kidney disease in the presence of A2 or A3, here the superiority is to use either angiotensin receptor blocker or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. In patients with chronic kidney disease, use antihypertensive drugs if blood pressure is above 140 over 90. Using both ACE inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated here. The dual usage of these agents is not recommended in patients with chronic kidney disease. For patients with chronic kidney disease, aiming toward a systolic blood pressure less than, of less than 120, has shown benefits were well tolerated. So we should, for the patient, aggressively monitoring the patient meticulously. So in people with chronic kidney disease, where treatment is being, is being targeted to less than 120 millimeter mercury, close follow-up of patients is recommended to identify treatment related adverse effects, including hypotension, syncope, electrolyte abnormalities, and acute kidney injury. If we cannot follow up these patients, it's better to avoid this uh, low target. For diabetic chronic kidney disease patient, the same use antihypertensive if blood pressure exceeding 140 over 90, use the first line drug. It, uh, there is superiority for the use of, for, toward the use of ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker if there is albuminuria or proteinuria. A systolic blood pressure target of less than 120 may be considered for patients with diabetes in home prevention of a stroke prioritized. So generally we don't like this target in all diabetic, but for those uh, home prevention of stroke prioritized, it's better to close follow up this patient as I mentioned in the CKD uh, statement. Again the same. If we have state 3, 3B, this means less than 45 mL per minute estimated GFR. Here, with the guideline, European Best Practice Guidelines suggest against applying lower blood pressure target in patients with diabetes and the CKD is 63B or higher than in general population. And they suggest in these patients without proteinuria, all blood pressure lowering drugs can be used equally to lower blood pressure and the superiority for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker, one of them is when there is proteinuria. Again, uh, the axis of renin angiotensin aldosterone, this is aldosterone and the salt. You can find here a lot of problem because of aldosterone and salt, renal tumor dysfunction, interstitial, renal glomerulus, adipocyte and other mechanisms. You can find disturbance in the, all the environments leading at the end into proteinuria and renal dysfunction. This is why I ask you if there is a room for the use of mineralocorticoid antagonist in chronic kidney disease. This a very recent review shows these key points. Mineralocorticoid receptor agonist antagonists are highly effect, uh, efficacious for further reducing albuminuria when added to ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Using petromer, which is a potassium binding polymer, because we are afraid if we use mineral corticoid antagonist in a patient with chronic kidney disease, hyperkalemia uh, develops. So, using petromer, which is a potassium binding polymer, 
is well tolerated and enables the use of these agents in people with advanced coronary kidney disease. Use of Batromir has been shown to further reduce aldosterone as well as reduce blood pressure when used with uh, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. A novel non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, phenyrenone, which is associated with less hyperkalemia, is currently being tested in both renal and cardiovascular outcomes trials to examine the effects on outcomes. So it seems that there is innovation in this sector. This is the review regarding the global cardiovascular protection in coronary kidney disease. Coronary kidney disease are accompanied by a very substantial increase in cardiovascular risk. What I want to stress on this slide is this molecule, which is LCZ696, that shows a clear improvement in cardiovascular outcomes accompanied by improved renal function and reduced hyperkalemia. So what is LCZ696? It is a combination drug, combination of valsartan, which is angiotensin receptor blocker. When we block angiotensin 2 receptor, we will, we will block all the bad effects of angiotensin uh, receptor stimulation from vasoconstriction. So if we block this, we will ameliorate all these. So the, uh, we will ameliorate vasoconstriction uh, so uh, blood pressure will be reduced, the tone is reduced, the aldosterone level is reduced, the hypertrophy is reduced. And so the, it is valsartan and sec, secobitril. Secobitril is nebrilessin inhibitor. What's nebrilessin? Nebrilessin is, uh, uh, stim is stimulating the catabolism of BNB. So when we antagonize the nebrilessin, what will happen? We will, we, we will have the BNB action in persistence. So we'll have fast dilatation, more reduction blood pressure, more reduction in sympathetic activity, more reduction aldosterone. So it seems that LCZ696 is a new addition in the cardiovascular uh, status. Uh, regarding the use of this combination in chronic kidney disease, this is the, the, the rationale trial design and, and baseline data for the randomized multiple multi-center pilot study of using secopitril valsartan versus erbizartan in patients with chronic kidney disease. So we are waiting the results of this study in near future. So I finish now the hypertension and I go to different sectors. So you can go even more and more. Regarding diabetes, if we start early, we can say that the, our target in management of diabetes is to prevent complications. So this is according to the standard of medical care on this year, in 2016, optimizing glucose control to reduce the risk or slow the progression of diabetic kidney disease at the level A uh, of recommendation. But here, if we start early, because if we start late in the advanced chronic kidney disease, our task will be to avoid hypoglycemia. Regarding it, so it is better to start early to ad aggressively address the issue of diabetes. But here I'm going to stress upon the nephroprotective effect of some of newly introduced anti-diabetic drug. This is sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors and the concept of renal protection. Hyperfiltration occurs because of hemodynamic or tubular hypothesis. Hemodynamic hypothesis depend upon RAS system. So if we use RAS blockade, we'll reduce the single nephron JFR. But regarding the tubular hypothesis, it depends upon increasing sodium reabsorption in diabetes and hyperglycemia. And increasing sodium re reabsorption will lead to reduction in the delivery of sodium that uh, to the uh, sensed by the macrodensa and then decreasing adin adenosine so it will lead to a renal aff afferent renal vasodilatation and increasing single nephron jfr if we use sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor that inhibits the sodium reabsorption so it will reverse this uh, pathway so by controlling the diabetes states 
by using sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors plus rasplocate, we can block the two hypotheses, hypotheses for uh, hyperfiltration. And this is just to show in a diagram, in a figure here. This is elevated JFR. You'll find the afferent is dilated. Hyperfiltration is there. If we use sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors, here the afferent is constricted and everything is uh, normalized. Here, another value of the use of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor is to, di is to divert the progression of renin angiotensin pathway uh, from angiotensin 2 into angiotensin 1 to 7. 1 to 7 angiotensin uh, has beneficial effects. Do we have clinical studies? This is EMBA glufluzine, which is one of the sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors and the progression of kidney disease and type 2 diabetes. EMBA reg outcome trial. Here, the use of EMBA was associated with reduction of uh, the uh, renal outcome, uh, worsen, uh, incident or worsening nephropathy or composite in the points. And if you look here, worsening of nephropathy uh, progression of macro uh, of, uh, towards more and more albuminuria, doubling of serum creatinine, initiation of renal replacement therapy. Here there is a superiority. This drug is used either in 10 milligram or 25 milligram, and the, the inclusion criteria is estimated GFR should be above 30 milli per minute because above uh, below 30 milli per minute is it is risky to use this class of drugs. So it is better to start early and use. All, all the facilities. They're very interesting. Although it is animal study, it used 5-6 nephrectomy, which is an, an, a model of chronic kidney disease and renal fibrosis. And the the aim of the study was to compare the uh, here the nephroprotective effect of dibuprotidyl inhibitor linagliptin and the angiotensin 2 receptor blocker telmezartan. Here, the uh, linagliptin is equivalent to telemezartan in nephroprotection and the reduction of albuminuria. This means that, and the, the more interesting here is using a non-diabetic rat model. So it seems that this class of drug uh, has nephroprotection. Regarding obesity, physical exercise, and low birth weight, up to this moment, I finished the definition, was meant by progression. I addressed the non-modified risk factors, albuminuria, the hypertension, diabetes. Regarding obesity, here this one of the outreaches the, uh, within the one of outreaches at Sohag uh, University. Here we measured the Western Conference, and here in the uh, Mansoura University Hospital World Kidney Day. Here you can find the brochure. This is the obesity. Obesity is associated with chronic kidney disease, and here the more the body mass index, the more the albuminuria, and the more the reduction in, in GFR. Here, if you compare, so this is the percentage. The percentage of patients with low estimated GFR resistantly less than 60 increase with uh, increasing body mass index. And the same result with waist circumference in women and men. The bigger the belly, the higher the risk for albuminuria and uh, chronic kidney disease. What is the mechanism of obesity? leading to chronic kidney disease. The mechanism is a dual mechanisms. The uh, either direct effects or indirect effects. Direct effects through glomerular hyperfiltration, pro-inflammatory cytokine, altered, all these are altered within the obesity and the adiposity. And here indirect effect through increasing the risk of hypertension diabetes and atherosclerosis. So the mechanism is dual. Uh, or according to this nice, nice review, that obesity is associated with abnormalities in renal microcirculation. Here, this is the uh, capillaries, brittle capillaries or glomerular capillaries. The injury, the injury occurring for these uh, microvascular uh, or microcirculation lead at the end toward the progression of kidney disease. One of the important and applied message is the status of natriuresis with and its correlation with obesity. Here, the, the, 
the relationship between blood pressure and atresis in normal in lean normotensive persons the it is here as you see the abrice is there but the natriuresis is blunted in obese, hyp obese hypertensive individual. This means that obese individuals are salt sensitive. And one of the risk factors here, as you see, is releasing of aldosterone releasing factor from visceral obesity, leading to increasing aldosterone. Again, the aldosterone and the value of using monoclonal corticoid receptor antagonist in this population. This is why in obstructive sleep apnea, there is a role of uh, aldosterone antagonist. Uh, here I want to split obesity from fitness. Yes, obesity may, resu may result from a sedentary life, but we encourage all patients to walk, to have exercise, because exercise benefits the kidney and reduce the progression and retard the progression of chronic kidney disease and lower the risk for stone formation. And here, what are the effects? What are the effects of bariatric surgery or renal function in obese patients? In this systematic review and meta-analysis, the conclusion is bariatric surgery could prevent further decline in renal function by reducing proteinuria and albuminuria and improving glomerular hyperfiltration in obese patients with impaired renal function. However, whether bariatric surgery reverses CKD or delays in the stage kidney disease progression is still in question. Here I want to just to say obesity is bad and we should address the body weight gain with with circumference, body mass index, all the parameters that can uh, be used as an index for obesity should be uh, put in mind and to educate people toward the uh, use uh, healthy using healthy diets to avoid weight gain because we have currently obesity related glomerulopathy and we can diagnose it in the biopsy by low density you will find the low number of glomeruli and high volume this means the glomerulomegaly the other way low birth weight low birth weight is considered a risk factor for the future occurrence of chronic kidney disease to the extent that some authorities recommend not to use a live donor uh, if they have a history of low birth weight. And this is very nice data because even if the person is low birth weight and his sibling is low birth weight, this increases the risk more and more. So this is regarding good weight and obesity. Regarding chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disorders, serum phosphorus is bad for the kidney progression. The higher the serum phosphorus, the higher the risk of toward kidney progression. Again, is it a risky? Is it a risk of high serum phosphorus or high phosphorus in diet? This was the study rationale. Here they addressed fraction excretion of phosphorus, which denotes oral phosphate intake and the serum phosphorus, and the correlation of both variables with progression of chronic kidney disease. And they found that only hyperphosphatemia and not oral phosphate are, uh, uh, is correlated with uh, progression of chronic kidney disease. Another risk factor is hypomagnesemia. So the bad combination is hypomagnesemia and hyperphosphatemia. The presence of this combination increase the risk of chronic kidney disease progression. And now we know magnesium is beneficial to prevent vascular calcification and we are waiting further studies that show uh, the value of magnesium. Here, serum uh, fibroblast growth factor 23, which increased, which is increased within the evolution of chronic kidney disease. This study shows that the higher the FGF23 above 170, irrespective of the model of uh, adjustment, the risk for a chronic kidney disease progression in children increases. Again, in this study, beta-H is bad also. For the higher the beta-H, the higher the, the risk of progression. So all the parameters of chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disorders, affect chronic kidney disease progression. So what is the message? The message is to put this axis in mind, to start early, look at different parameters serially, serum phosphorus, serum beta-H, serum magnesium, and FHF23, and to start early for uh, ameliorating the abnormalities because uh, all these abnormalities 
abnormalities in all these parameters are associated with uh, progression. Regarding diet, this is the one of the concepts, dietary energy density. What's meant by dietary energy density? It is the amount of calories there is their weight. Per day. So if we compare 100 gram of rice with 100 gram of tomatoes, you can know the different degree. There is a great difference in the amount of calories. So the higher the density of calories, the higher the progression of chronic kidney disease. Here, we should educate all peoples towards adjustment of salt because sodium restriction is associated with better outcome and reduction of albuminuria. Even in this study, which is a randomized control trial, placebo run, a control trial, uh, assessing effects of vitamin D receptor activation and dietary sodium restriction on residual albuminuria and chronic kidney disease. This is a virtual uh, chronic kidney disease trial. And here the uh, restriction of sodium to the level of 1.2 gram per day, this is a modest restriction, leads to a great difference. And the conclusion is moderate dietary sodium restriction substantially reduced residual albuminuria during fixed dose angiotensin converting enzyme inhibition. The additional effects of the vitamin D receptor activation uh, was small and non significant. Again, here the 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 most important and most impressive effect is to uh, is to is to follow sodium restriction rather than using vitamin D receptor activation. So we should educate people towards sodium restriction. Regarding the uh, the value of 1.2, this means 2.4 sodium chloride because sodium is accompanied by chloride. Regarding dash diet, dash diet. Diet, diet approach to stop hypertension. Uh, this approach, this diet style was addressed uh, since many decades in hypertension. But here, regarding the CKD progression was DASH diet. DASH diet means low calories, low salt, uh, and high fruits and vegetables. And if we start this early, uh, and instead of being late, because we're late, we are afraid of hyperkalemia, using DASH diet, uh, may help in the retarding progression of chronic kidney disease. The concept of dietary acid load, dietary acid load associates with high protein diet because protein leads to acid. And fruits and the vegetables are negative with acid load. So the higher the protein, the higher the dietary acid load, the higher the risk for progression in adults, chronic kidney disease in adults. Uh, so we educate patients toward the low protein diet. What's meant by low protein diet is using a protein in this range between 0.6 to 0.8 gram per kg per day. And if we use protein in, the, in this range, we can expect all these benefits, decreasing glomerular hyperfiltration, decreased proteinuria, decreased uremic toxin, decreased oxidative stress, decreased metabolic acidosis, decreased phosphorus and BTH, decreased insulin resistance and improving insulin uh, responsiveness, decreased blood pressure, better uremic control. All these are benefits, but be careful to avoid protein in energy wasting. So we should give adequate calories and to avoid, to avoid the environments of malnutrition because malnutrition is very bad and even lead to more worse clinical outcomes. So if we use low protein diet and to avoid malnutrition, this will be perfect for our patients. This is why uh, the, uh, we examine the concept of phosphate protein dilemma in patients with chronic kidney disease and on dialysis. The, in a very simple uh, statement, we like to give our patients, especially on dialysis, here in dialysis patients and in CKD, we would like to give them sufficient amount of proteins, but we don't like to give them surplus amount of phosphorus. So how to reach this? Because we know that all the bio all high biological values proteins include phosphorus. Uh, because if we if we know this same recommendation, the first one is shows commercial food items prepared with phosphorus containing food additives, uh, without without phosphorus containing food additives. Because phos phosphorus uh, food additives include inorganic phosphorus. The bioavailability of this organic phosphorus approximates 100%. And there is no 
nutritional value of using food additives. So this is the potential benefit is relatively straightforward. Can remove up to 600 to 700 milligram of phosphorus. Can simultaneously look for other nutrients as well. But there is some consideration. Information on phosphorus additives may be difficult to access. Small print of ingredients. Additive free products may cost more. The second recommendation, so I recommend for all patients in chronic kidney disease and on dialysis to avoid food additives. Preparing foods at home using wet, wet cooking methods such as boiling and discard soup because soup includes a big amount of phosphorus. Straightforward, can remove up to 50%, may remove other minerals like potassium, but require that patients have the time skills, function, and the facilities to prepare foods. With cooking, methods are not appropriate for all foods, like peanut, butter, sandwich. Third recommendation, substitute commonly eaten high phosphorus foods with nutritionally equivalent foods that are lower in bioavailable phosphorus. Here, we depends upon a nutritionist or dietitian. Here can remove 100 milligram per serving. Maybe best only option for some foods like dairy products can become overwhelming. This is a concentration required nutrition expertise and culturally appropriate substitutes are not always available. So these are simple recommendations to stop food additives, to boil the uh, meat in, uh, that uh, is prepared in small pieces and to discard soup, at these are simple recommendation. And this is an, another study showing the same uh, information, replacing phosphorus containing food additives with foods without additives, reduce the phosphatemia in the kidney disease. Again, this is a food, the category of food, the type of phosphorus additives, and this is a substitution, and you can fix this slide and read it in details. Regarding the keto analog supplementation, which is more exciting for the nephrology world, using keto analog ketosterol supplementation. So this is a very low protein diet. Very low protein diet means less than uh, in the normal, in the low protein diet is between 0.6 to 0.8. Here, low protein diet is 0.3 gram per kg per day. Very low protein diet. To keep nutritional state, we should use keto analog supplementation. Here, the keto steel should be used one uh, tablet for for each five kilograms. Suppose that we have a patient hundred kilograms, so should uh, he should consume twenty tablet or capsule per day. It's very cumbersome, and this this study included relatively few number of patients, and they were adherent to diet. So uh, up to this moment, I cannot recommend the use of keto analog supplementation because there is no sufficient evidence for the superiority to uh, coronary kidney disease patients. A very nice study showed that diet soda consumption increases the risk of incident in the disease in this cohort including 15,000 persons. Why? Maybe due to the, the additives for the diet soda. And here the National Kidney Foundation recommends say no to that diet soda and they showed that in the in the details of this uh, information that only one cup of diet soda is fine but more than one cup of uh, uh, diet soda may increase the risk of uh, coronary kidney disease folic acid is beneficial according to this study the using 10 milligram in april plus 0.8 milligram folic acid in comparison to an april alone shows superiority of folic acid for protecting kidneys and this was the study uh, addressing efficacy of folic acid therapy on progression of chronic kidney disease, renal sub-study of the China Stroke Primary Prevention Trial. And this is um, the, uh, the current uh, uh, issue of the Kidney International Summer this, uh, this month. Folic acid supplementation and chronic kidney disease progression. Here you can read the digest in contrast to prior studies demonstrating no benefit or even increased harm from uh, vitamin uh, B supplementation in patients with chronic kidney disease, a large randomized trial from China recently 
demonstrated small but statistically significant reductions in the risk of first stroke and chronic disease progression with the addition of folic acid to enolabril in adults with hypertension. Differences in the study population and the study intervention may explain these discordant results. So we are waiting further studies in folic, uh, for assessing folic acid. Another terminology in nutrition, which is excessive protein intake relative to fiber. We encourage fiber because fiber is one of the, uh, is very beneficial antioxidant and uh, has many, uh, fiber uh, has many beneficial effects and uh, retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. But here, protein, uh, the higher the protein, relative to fiber, the more the worse of progression here. If the ratio increase above this cutoff point, here you can find the odds for uh, the hazards ratio for cardiovascular disease, fatal and non-fatal events, including progression of chronic disease increases. Again, gut microbiome, gut microbiota, uh, very, this is a very nice study, the 5-6 nephrectomy renal fibrosis study showed that in this animal model, proteinuria increases and in the, simultaneously the uh, bacteroids increase and the lactobacillus, uh, uh, lactobacillus reduces. And when they treated rats with lactobacillus, albuminuria uh, reduced, w was reduced. This means that lactobacillus is beneficial and to protect against kidney damage. Regarding microbiota, we have ter many terminology. We have probiotic, prebiotic, symbiotic, and dysbiosis. Pre probiotic means using bacteria li like lactobacillus. Prebiotic using fibers because fiber stimulates the uh, probiotic. Uh, using uh, fibers plus bacteria, this is symbiosis. Regarding dysbiosis, dysbiosis means abnormalities in the gut microbiota. In, uh, in chronic kidney disease, there is abnormality. So there is a relationship between the microbiota, gut microbiota, and the chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease disturb gut microbiome, and disturbance in gut microbiome increase the risk of chronic kidney disease. Here, this, this study showed that treated yogurt with, lept, with um, probiotic uh, was beneficial for chronic kidney disease. Regarding oxalobacter formigenes, this is a study that shows that the use of oxalobacter uh, formigenes uh, leads to reduction in oxaloria because of stimulating oxalate transport and secretion by intestinal epithelial cells. And this will lead to decreasing oxalosis and increasing oxalate stones. A very strong cohort, including more than 3 million individuals, address the correlation of constipation with incidence chronic, incident chronic kidney disease. Constipation reflects, may reflect a disturbance in gut microbiome as well. So this is why gut kidney access is very striking and we need to know a lot about that. Here, the more the constipation, the more the risk of cumulative chronic kidney disease and even the higher the and in the kidney disease, and the higher the degree, the, st the uh, severity of constipation, the higher the risk of chronic kidney disease. Regarding metabolic acidosis, so up to this point, I, do, the, um, I finished from the definition of chronic kidney disease, what's meant by progression, and then I discussed some risk factors like albuminuria, like uh, the age, race, and uh, gender, and then blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, diet, microbiome, CKD, MBD, all these, are fa all these factors are addressed in this presentation. I'm going to continue with regarding metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is bad because lowering GFR leads to uh, hydrogen retention that leads to a reduction in the restitution pH uh, and this will lead to increasing androtensin aldosterone, increasing endothelin, increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines and the chemokines increase in H3 with activation of complement. At the end of the day, we'll have interstitial fibrosis and more and more progression. This is why the kidney guidelines recommend correction of acidosis, but to avoid alkalosis. So it's better to keep serum bicarb in chronic kidney disease between 22 to 24 or 25 millimole per liter. So this and oh, this table shows 
the different agents and the dosage and the consideration for the these parameters here i want to just to add a statement if we are starting in hypertension hypertension or diabetes stage one or two and we, we encourage people even to consume a lot of fruits and the vegetable this may correct even acidosis equivalent to the use of these agents but in the advanced chronic kidney disease we are afraid of hyperkalemia so again would like to have bicarb within the normal range hyperuricemia uric acid is bad here in the mesoamerican nephropathy uric acid is is in the corner stone uh, that leads to tubular injury and uh, retarding the progression the kidney disease and this is the study the systematic review and meta-analysis that showed that in 25,000 patients with CKD, hyperuricemia is associated with mortality. So it is time to target uric acid. Although KDGO guidelines on 2012 uh, has no uh, clear statement and, uh, and the guidelines uh, left in nephrologist either to treat or not to treat according to their preference, but according to the publications i'm now convinced by treating your hyperuricemia but was starting very low by very low dose and going slow and to monitor the side effects of the drug so it's time to target uric acid to retard ckd progression why uric acid increases ckd progression because of all these bad effects renin coxy 2 epithelium is a transformations increasing at beach oxidase at the end, you will find disturbance in the kidney environments and the progression of kidney disease. And this is a study from Japan uh, shows that showed that if uric acid is above 5.9, the cumulative incidence of CKD increases and the albuminuria increases as well. And here, the rate of progression increases if uh, uric acid is above 5.9. And this is a nice study in, in type 2 diabetes, hyperuricemia contributes to the faster progression of diabetic kidney disease. Again and again, uh, uh, it is time to treat hyperuricemia. I'm convinced, although they are waiting further evidence because all these studies that include fibroxetate or aliprenone targeted few uh, number of patients. So we are waiting uh, further evidence, but the cumulative data, cumulative data from observation studies correlates hyperuricemia with bad kidney outcome. Statin and chronic kidney disease. Here, the European Best Practice Guideline on Diabetes recommending using statin for stage 3b and 4 and suggest superiority of statin in stage 5, but uh, to recommend against using statin in dialysis. If, uh, uh, and the, the most important when we use statin for chronic kidney disease patients is uh, to, to look at the dose and to, to modify the dose according to the stage here, if estimated GFR is less than 45 mg per minute, the maximum at is 20 mg and the risk of a statin 10 mg, so we should be aware of that. But currently, we have new guidelines for the statin and new recommendation. Statin recommended for patients 40 to 75 with one risk factor, like, for example, if we have an adult between 40 to 75 and we are expecting at the risk of coronary, in the coming 10 years, it is, and even if the patient is just only smoker, it's better to use a statin. And this is the uh, full article. A statin used for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease in adults. United States Preventive Service Services Task Force Recommendation Statement. Here, the statement if, uh, here, adult between 40 to 75 with no history of cardiovascular disease, but he, the patient has more than one cardiovascular risk, one or more cardiovascular risk factor, and the calculated 10 years cardiovascular disease events uh, risk uh, more than 10%. Here, initiate use of low to moderate dose statin with uh, reasonable evidence. Here, if the, uh, if the risk between here, the use statin, but the uh, level of evidence is grade C. If the uh, expected calculated 10-year uh, cardiovascular disease event between 7.5 to 10 percent. But if the patient is above 76 years, there is no recommendation 
to use statin. Again, it seems that statin can be used uh, for all to protect to protect against cardiovascular disease. Regarding niacin, niacin and the progression of chronic kidney disease, there is a combined trial. We are waiting the result of combined trial that combined phosphate binder binders with um, niacin because niacin blocks phosphate absorption by blocking phosphate transporters in the, in the intestine. So niacin reduce hyperphosphatemia. Niacin leads to decreased oxidative stress, decreased bad cytokines, and we are waiting further evidence to recommend using uh, niacin. Again, drugs, this is an example. All drugs can be considered nephrotoxin. And so this, they, all drugs should be prescribed by doctors who are experts in the field of medicine and to avoid the abuse of any medicine. Here, the proton bomb inhibitor, one of the important class of drugs that target hyperacidity. But look here, if they are abused, they increase the risk of chronic kidney disease, acute kidney disease, acute interstitial nephritis, hypomagnesemia, if they are used above more than three months, colostridium difficile, community acquired pneumonia, uh, ventilator pneumonia, bone fractures from uh, disturbance in calcium. So a lot of side effects can be expected from the abusing proton bomb inhibitor. Yes, we should use them when they are indicated, but not to abuse them. It is time to sound the alarm and the correlation between proton bomb inhibitors and the risk of incidence, chronic kidney disease, and the progression toward indecision disease was evident from this study that compared the 20,000 H2 blocker users uh, versus 173,000 uh, BPI users here using BPI was associated with more common doubling of serum creatinine, more uh, retarding the progression uh, and increasing the decline in Smith GFR, the more the development of initial kidney disease, and even when they further uh, do the analysis using propensity matching, 20,000 versus 20,000, they found the same using proton bomb inhibitor is bad for the kidney. So it's better to avoid the abusing of proton bomb inhibitors. They have just, just a fine review for using medicinal, medicinal plants for the treatment of kidney and urinary stones here in this uh, area of the period in of the world. 18 plants used for kidney stones, so uh, either uh, boiled or taken fresh. Uh, but in, this, in Shiraz, the, uh, after, in, in this article, they recommend that if we know the uh, purified extract from the plant, it's better than uh, taking the plant. And this is one of the studies that is very surprisingly showed they used or prescribed Chinese herbal medicine was associated with less risk of endocrine kidney disease. Here, the user and here the non-user. So it seems that a Chinese herbal remedies is protective. But again, I don't recommend the use of herbal remedies. Why? Because usually herbal remedies are adulterated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, diuretics, laxative. This an example of the bad effects of uh, Herbal remedies because this plant, Aristolotion, uh, can contaminate the wheat, and when we eat wheat contaminated with Aristolotion plant, this is the result: interstitial fibrosis and chronic interstitial nephritis, and the DNA adapt and the tumorigenesis of urinary tract. And the herbal remedies are adulterated by Aristolotion plant as well. So we are not sure of the purity of herbal remedies. So this is why I don't recommend using herbal remedies to treat chronic kidney disease patients. This regarding the, this is a very nice study showed that this herb uh, has a toxicity to the proximal uh, tubule. If you would like to study the dietary supplements, this is a very nice overview of herbs and dietary supplements, efficacy, safety, and the government regulation in the United States in 115 pages. What's your expectation? How many food supplements uh, they had in the United States? Data supplement label database include over 50,000. And 40% of them were uh, vitamins or mineral, and 20% uh, specialty and uh, botanical 
herb, uh, herb is 20% and sport supplement 16%. So it's better to know the, all these issues. Regarding the Arabic gum, even uh, uh, if Arabic gum is used as supplement for chronic kidney disease to ameliorate some symptoms, this is a case that showed that using Arabic gum uh, leads to hypercalcemia and acute renal failure. This is because Arabic gum includes uh, high calcium content and stimulates uh, in style absorption of calcium. Again, dealing with pharmacists and with all health service nurse, doctor, pharmacist make a big difference here. If using pharmacists to improve risk stratification and management of chronic kidney disease, here if the pharmacist dispense S inhibitor, for example, he can educate the patient to monitor albuminuria. Another risk factor is smoking. Smoking is kidney poison. Irrespective to anything, we should educate our patients in a simple manner. Boy, smoking is kidney poison. And here is the, the uh, a study that showed in 5-6 nephrectomy, chronic kidney disease uh, model, that smoking reduces microRNA 29B3, which is antifibrotic. Sleep disorders are bad, either of sleep apnea, sleep apnea or disturbance in sleep uh, are associated with more chronic, more uh, occurrence of chronic kidney disease and more progress, progression of chronic kidney disease. To the extent that sleepless in chronic kidney disease, it's a novel risk factor for CKD progression. We should educate our patients who are healthy sleep. As a nephrologist, we should ask all patients admitted or to the nephrology um, about a history of acute kidney injury. And if there is acute kidney injury, especially if it is in higher stage, and especially if it occurs for a long, uh, uh, it needs a longer time for recovery, or the patient is in a situation is stated dialysis, all these are risk factors for progression of coronary kidney disease. And we should uh, put them in uh, our mind. And this study showed that occurrence of community acquired uh, acute kidney injury uh, is associated with uh, progression of chronic kidney disease and mortality. In elderly per persons, we should be careful about the using of uh, raspocate, and we should use them when they are indicated with the presence of proteinuria, but we should use them in very low dose and, and go slow. And we can respect the pharmacokinetics here if you look at ACE inhibitors, 100% captopril, 100% renally excreted. Uh, so all these are excreted through kidney. This is in in in, uh, in uh, if you look at angiotensin receptor blockers, different angiotensin receptor blocker, blocker, you will find the majority of them are excreted through liver. So this is why, if we look at the results in elderly, if we compare control who, uh, patients who received no RAS blocker, the use of RAS blockers either is inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is associated with more incident acute kidney injury. But if you look at the difference between ARBs and ACE inhibitor, ACE inhibitor use is associated with more frequent incidence of acute kidney injury. And if we use is inhibitor with overdose, we should, so we should be careful about the dose uh, in the elderly patients because this article was addressing the use of RAS blockers in the aged patients. So it's better to use uh, ARBs in a well calculated dose and to avoid overdose in elderly patients. Another drug, which is anticoagulation related nephropathy, this is a new term, relatively new term in nephrology, especially, and this is the progression of kidney disease, especially in a patient treated with chronic kidney disease, treated with uh, warfarin and targeting INR above three. So all these are risk factors for uh, warfarin related nephropathy, INR above three, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, old age, all these are risk factors and it is not restricted only to warfarin, but it is also uh, the uh, progression of kidney disease can occur due to the use of anticoagulation because of some bleeding. This is why we stress upon monitoring kidney function 
uh, in the initiation phase more frequent and if SMH GFR is uh, suppressed also we uh, advise more frequent uh, monitoring the estimated GFR so here in the initiation phase every three to four weeks either warfarin or direct oral anticoagulation if SMH GFR is fine every six months in warfarin and every year in uh, direct oral anticoagulation if here uh, SMH GFR is between 30 to 60 so every two three months in warfarin and six months in direct oral anticoagulation if it is uh, less than 30 milli per minute this means you are staging four it is better to monitor warfarin monitor kidney function every two three months in warfarin and the same three months in direct oral anticoagulation regarding inflammation inflammation is bad for the kidney uh, because it uh, has there is many in the all these are infl inflammatory environment inflammatory environment uh, has a crosstalk bad crosstalk with the kidney leading to progression of kidney disease and fibrosis to the extent that in the study when they looked at the values of C-reactive protein on the initial cohort in the initial study they found that the higher the C-reactive protein the higher the progression toward the indecision kidney disease so and this is another risk effect, another cohort study including approximately 900 patients inflammation is associated with, with more progression of chronic kidney disease and here they found that inflammation was uh, expressed by increasing plasma level of hydrogen and nf alpha or low serum albumin because serum albumin is negative phase reactant so the presence of this in inflammation environment predicts progression of chronic kidney disease regarding polycystic kidney disease we have pro bkd score which is uh, looking at the a and the gender males is offered one point hypertension before age of 35 two points uh, urological even, events in polycystic kidney patients before the age of 32 35 uh, over two points uh, pkd1 non-truncating mutation 2 uh, truncating mutation 4 so this is a total score of 9 even if we don't have genetic study and we we'll just look at five points just give a hint the higher the score the here the lower the score the delayed the progression and occurrence of indecision at the advanced age and the higher the score the more the progression and occurrence of indecision in relatively younger age and this is a complicated study using proteomics to look at urinary peptidome to block to predict who will progress using res resveratrol which is a natural polyphenol and its effects in polycystic kidney disease is shown in this uh, review and focus all these are good effects of uh, this natural polyphenol antifibrotic anti-inflammatory antioxidant anti all these are good effects and it's only bad effects at the end of the day using uh, resveratrol may be beneficial for these patients but we are still need a lot of studies this is an animal study showing the wild rats polycystic rat heterozygous here this is a vehicle is used here this is the cyst there but when resveratrol is used here you can find the difference between res treated and non and the vehicle treated here you can find that resveratrol may be a new hope in polycystic kidney disease but we are waiting a lot of evidence and studies but for polycystic kidney disease uh, what is uh, evident we should educate patients toward uh, aggressive blood pressure control in the early beginning and to um, uh, avoid dehydration. Other risk factors like von Willebrand to Adam the 13 ratio and decline of SMH GFR as you see in this slide. Uh, regarding the uh, type of nephrectomy in this uh, cohort study, radical versus uh, partial nephrectomy, it is uh, axiomatic that radical nephrectomy is associated with more reduction in the uh, nephron mass uh, but uh, this study showed an evidence that it showed it is correlated with progression and mortality as well this is why we should discuss with the urologist if there is tumor in a kidney that can be treated with partial nephrectomy it is better 
if, if we can treat it with partial nephrectomy, but it depends upon the evaluation of urologist and the type of the tumor and size. The very fine, funny study showed that ear length is associated with uh, good kidney function. So the uh, longer the ear you have, the better the function of the kidney you will have, and the lower the uh, deterioration of the kidney function. Here in donors with long ears, the decline in GFR is significantly less than a donor with, with short ears. I'm not going to, 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 to give a comment about that, but up to this moment, I define chronic kidney disease, and I mentioned the schema for definition it, that unified the uh, definitions between all nephrologists, and then I'll, I mentioned all risk factors like albuminuria, hypertension, diabetes, age, race, and gender, inflammation, diet, obesity, and all factors that I mentioned in this presentation. And then I'm going to just to finish with risk prediction because we cannot prevent what we cannot predict in this study. They have the data and they can predict the occurrence of progression of kidney disease. The kidney failure risk equation is a tool that may be used in combination with clinical judgment to stratify patients that may be at higher risk of progression to kidney failure. But to stratify the patient who should have data, so, so this is the, a call for data registry for everything, taking good history, examination, everything should be registered. Because if we don't have data, we cannot change anything. And this is a dynamic predictive model for progression. We can predict uh, the, in, a, in a dynamic way the progression of kidney disease. So let us go to the conclusion and closure of the presentation by the, what is my vision. The vision is to improve education, is to put the patient-centeredness approach, the patient-centered approach in the focus. Patient-centered approach means that we should behave that we are uh, we are treating ourselves because uh, progression from stage to stage uh, means a lot, a lot of cost and a lot of comorbidities and mortality. This is why in some countries uh, they address the CKD DOPS, not DOPS, it is CKD OPS, CKD Outcome and Practice Pattern Study, just to optimize the environment in man of management. We need supportive care, comprehensive conservative care, and one of the most important aims is to delay the progression of kidney disease, because delaying the progression uh, means a lot. And the, uh, I, I always like the crosswords, and this is one of the more recent uh, publications, the Kidney International showing the antihypertensive agent in crossword. This means that there, they like the science, and they like the patients, and they have their fun even in uh, education, uh, for management. At the end of, presentation, of this presentation, it's not enough to do your best. You must know what to do and then do your best. And just to uh, show you, this is from Colombo, and here the ancient Egyptian medicine, no well, new well, the scalpel, new well, all surgical instruments, and we should regain this history. And on the Wednesday, November 16th, this was the opening of new addition to the nephrology education by starting the series of advanced training in renal nutrition analysis. I have the honor to have Professor Sobhi, the father of nephrology in Egypt, um, uh, in welcoming the opening of uh, that day. And I uh, hear this, this is a photo of some of the trainee with some professors and my colleagues and uh, Professor uh, Samir Sali, uh, Dr. Osama Shahad, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Karim, the Professor Ghada, uh, Dr. Adua, uh, and uh, Dr. Salwa, and all these, uh, you are welcomed in this uh, new education in nephrology, renal nutrition and dialysis, and we hope that you will enjoy with us. This was the starting point, and then we will have many, many, many issues many assignments and many workshops just to satisfy your needs. This is our uh, objective and our hope. Thank you very much. And I'll be very happy 
if you interact with me through the uh, the our site the egyptian site of nephrology virtual academy and or through the uh, closed group on the facebook thank you very much and goodbye